thanks for coming. We have um, more staff members than we do community members tonight, which is great. I uh, was talking to one of our employees the other day, and he said, I cannot believe how much they're aware about the color of our community town halls. Uh, so that uh, that's shows us that we have always have to do a better job of keeping it. Uh, so thank you for joining us. We have a different set of agenda tonight, and we got some people watching online. We're open to any kind of questions or concerns as we, as we talk through this. I just want to take a minute and say um, a thank you. We have had, I've had a community member uh, stop me at Walmart the other day. She's like, you guys doing anything during the summer? And I said, oh, yeah, we work all summer. We are very busy. Our IT folks, uh, I think we're installing how many systems? 29 UPSs, 250 computers, and monitors. I mean, massive, massive amounts of updates going on our campus. And so, in our uh, grounds uh, maintenance crew, um, I gave them a mountain of a list for the summer. Uh, we've had athletes helping out. Uh, we had a campus cleanup there yesterday. I think we're visually, we're starting to see things on campus uh, take a step forward, which is awesome. Uh, I was a little sore this morning for my. I'm just getting older a lot. I was pulling weeds for a while yesterday, and, and, and this morning I woke up, my back was, was not, not a good spot. So, um, But it, it's just an, an exciting time. We're replacing a bunch of carpet on campus. We're painting a bunch. Uh, uh, a couple of roofs are getting redone, so that's, that's excellent. Other things as an institution that we have going on, uh, we did hire two quality ag instructors that I'm static about. Uh, we are bringing back the livestock judging team so we have a group of donors that are helping us to go out and fundraise for that. We actually have some students committed already at the beginning of this fall. I think it's our biggest opportunity that we have on our campus uh, for growth. We had a very low number of students, and I think we can grow that to a very high number in a short period of time. Uh, so we're really excited about that. We, we've had <coughs> a bunch of faculty members. We have Preston, Preston Handy, our new athletic coordinator, and eligibility. Correct. See, I don't just sign those forms. I'll read them every once in a while. That's a longer one. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, and then we have Maddie Day, who's been around for a bit. You met, met got a chance to meet her. She's been in the community for a long time. Uh, she's in our our uh, finance area to continue to take on more and more duties, and we are very excited to have her join us as well. Um, when we look going forward, uh, we had our board meeting last night. Uh, we have just a lot of moving parts. Um, we're doing some restructuring as a, as a college. Uh, we're reorganizing a little bit. We're shifting some things from other people underneath my area. We're combining some positions. And I was talking to an employee for the day, and I said, well, you know, it's just a lot of change. I said, it is. I said, but if we don't change, we don't change just to change. But if we don't change, we're not making improvements, we're not moving forward. And, and, when I, and it takes a holistic approach, right? And uh, we look at our credit hours, <laughs> decrease over the last five or six years. There hasn't been a, a, a anything that we've done. It's just we're at the point now that if we're really going to turn that around and grow, we got to be willing to change something. Uh, so first up, uh, uh, Dennis Sander, our VP of Finance Operations, is going to give us a quick update of the financial piece of the college. This time of year, Dennis is working very hard and long hours, trying to get budgets done, things like that. So I'll pass the floor Dennis. Uh, thank you, Brad. So tonight I'm just going to kind of give you an overview of our revenues, our expenditures, a little bit of our, our financial position, and talk a little bit about the budget procedure. Um, just for this current fiscal year, 2022, um, we're kind of projected about 15 to, million, uh, 15 to 16 million dollars in expenditures, and then uh, like the same for revenues, because we have a great deal of budget that we come in. Approximately <coughs> 37 percent. Goes to instruction and academic support. 16% goes to student services, which includes athletics in our particular case. A lot of places have it not fully refunded, but we do not. We put it in uh, kind of general and operate. And by the way, the funds I'm talking about are the operating expenses, what we call general fund and uh, tech ed fund, because we receive our fund money from the state from those two areas, and that's our general operating uh, uh, fund we're talking um, institutional support, which includes uh, administration and a number of other things, that's 24%. Then 21% of our expenditures goes to our plan, our physical plan, operations and maintenance, the lights, the, everything that's involved there. Then 2% is uh, student or third county tuition grant. So people who are uh, live in such a Seward County, or Seward County are eligible, they get a kind of grant. About two percent of the money that we receive from taxpayers goes from that to help pay for tuition. You know, we, we now I don't know, we're probably just under the fifty percent pile as far as uh, that tuition and fees are concerned. It used to be the lowest, but uh, we're taking up a little bit just to kind of sure that's happening. 
15, which is a 50% supply time. In fact, I don't know for certain, but I'm certain, pretty not sure that it's one of the highest in the state with regard to community college. So um, as far as independence, we're probably more independent than all or many other colleges in our state. 15% uh, comes from tuition and fees. And then 20% comes from state aid. And the state aid comes from with the, with the general fund, uh, general education funds, and then of course the tech ed funds I mentioned before. Plus a large amount comes from what used to be called SD, or SD 155, Senate Bill 155, now called uh, Excellence in Career Technical Education, I believe is the name of it right now. We get about $800,000 from that. Uh, so that's the high school kids who are in the come here to trade afterwards. Uh, and so that's, that's a challenge we have going forward now is that, that for many years uh, we've kind of held harmless, if you will, with regard to uh, receiving state aid. But th this year we went through the recent, this recent uh, became real. It had to be so real for the last 10 years at least. But as a result, uh, we, we are looked at being overfunded. And so we're going to have to make up that, that money that's put together. We're going to get it now. And that's in the neighborhood of 700 So actually that puts a, you know, a, a strain on our enrollment that we'll be talking about a little bit later. Uh, we've received, we actually received a lot of COVID money and we're in a very good position right now as we get a whole year to kind of identify uh, specifically what uh, is needed, what we can apply for. Just talked to the audit for today and it's, it's, it's very, it's like walking on ice. You think you got something, you gotta get that money spent then as she was talking to me today, and when she was talking to me about whether or not I could take some money back for lost revenue or uh, bad debt, but all I keep cautioning her that if I took some revenue, if it's a lost revenue, and then I go do some bad debt, that can't be double counted because essentially I've already received some money for that revenue, but if I go get collections, then, then I'll have double debt. So what I'm trying to press upon you is this very, it's fraught with but we do have a lot of money and we have a plan, we're starting up the plan to be able to do that next year. Um, then, as, uh, as far as our, just our general financial health, uh, our indebtedness is just under four million, or just over, just over four million is what we get at the end of this year. That's broken out between our, um, our dorms, uh, the residence halls, part of the facility. Um, the, uh, and that's, that particular one is just about two. I'm sorry, about one million is what I'm saying. The other one has to do with our allied health uh, building. Most of that debt is about three million. So when I talk about this round four, that's kind of where we're out at right now. Um, and with the, what they call certificate of participation. So, uh, at, so I, again, that puts us in a good stead. So much so that uh, over the years, uh, we continue to improve ourselves in a, in a financial situation. Our cash flow is very good. One you really want to look at is it what's called the composite index, and ours is in the last three years has been between five and seven. Uh, so if you get two or less, that that becomes kind of a dangerous zone. So as you can see, you know, we're way above that, and so again, yeah, we're in a very good position. <coughs> um, yeah. And so I guess I will.
this and there's conversations about some of the code that they're using. For example, if we put medical grade chlorine in the locker rooms, automatic uh, hand washers, automatic toilets, HVAC systems that have the HIPAA filters, we can make a lot of groundwork through that uh, without putting general plumbing hands into it. Um, so that's kind of the conversation that, that we're having. We're going to talk about change center a little bit more too, I think. So, any other questions? Just a couple things what Dennis said. So when I was years ago, when I was a CFO, uh, when I calculated my first CFI, we were at negative 2.8 uh, at that institution. Uh, so it was not a good place to be in. Uh, that's when we talked about that budget cut. <laughs> I don't really, I was talking to the group today, I don't think it has a budget cut. I mean, it, it, it is in a sense, but essentially we're going back to the funding model pre-2008. So we're talking about in-state students and general education students as we go to your funding. So we, we, we are now getting $220 of credit hour from the state for those students. Since 2008 till now, we've got to make, we've got a block, a block grant, a block, a block grant. Uh, didn't matter what our what our loan costs. So uh, that's as uh, that's as that's changed. I think it creates an opportunity. So I understand that we're going to be hit beginning of the long term. Right. Can I get you to use the mic? People yeah. over there can't really hear. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Eric's will come up next with our enrollment update. Everybody, uh, my, Eric Goldman, course director of admissions, right? Uh, I talked to you a little bit about uh, enrollment, and uh, luckily, our, our enrollment report came out uh, this afternoon. Big thanks to uh, Teresa Waymeyer, she's our uh, one of our data and research analysts here on campus, and, and she does uh, an amazing job of, of uh, keeping us up on the numbers. Uh, as far as uh, how enrollment looks uh, as a snapshot for this week. Uh, compared to this time last year, we're actually up just a little bit. Uh, we're up 9% in headcount, 6% in credit hours compared to this time uh, last week. Uh, what we're seeing on um, in the admissions office and kind of what we're seeing campus-wide is uh, new freshmen are kind of flat uh, so far. It's about the same as they were uh, at this time last year. But we're making huge jumps right now in our uh, continuing students and returning students. So students that are, are continuing through and, and completing their degree or returning students, students that have stopped out for a while and are, are coming back to college. So, uh, and this is great. Uh, We're uh, making some really great strides uh, as far as uh, that goes. So uh, one of the things that we are planning on doing for uh, new freshman enrollment, of course, uh, because everybody, you know how liberal is, everybody waits until the last minute, right? So we always see a large bumps in our enrollment in August. So one of the things that we're going to do, we're planning on uh, putting an enrollment clinic or calling it an enrollment planning day uh, coming here in about three weeks. And the idea behind that is to get students, no matter where they are in the admissions process, if, if, uh, they, if they haven't filled out an application all the way to they're just about ready to get enrolled, we're going to invite everybody in on those days and uh, we're going to help them with the process. We're going to get them as far as we can on that day. So that way, whenever they are ready to get enrolled in August, when the time comes around, We've removed some of those barriers for them. We've made it that much easier uh, for them to just uh, come on in and get in some classes. So uh, we're looking forward to that. It's coming up July 20th. It's tentative for right now, uh, the uh, uh, from 2 to 4 p.m. So, uh, and then of course, you know, Rachel's helping us out with that. We got postcards going out uh, for more students' perspective and returning students all throughout the area uh, to invite them to come back. But like I said, I mean, we need new freshmen, and hey, we, we've been making great strides with returning students as well. Uh, let's see, what else do we also have? Um, let me look, I got my notes here. I took a cue from Brad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we have approximately six weeks left uh, before students start uh, coming onto campus. Uh, they'll be uh, moving in on August 8th. We're also doing uh, some cool things with them whenever they come back uh, in August, uh, that, that first week of August. We're going to do more orientation and more enrollment uh, with them that August. Help them connect them to campus because that's one thing that Research definitely shows, you know, the more you have orientation, the more they're connected to campus, the greater their success, you know, and the more they'll stick around. So we're working on some uh, more of those orientation deals coming up uh, before classes actually start. And of course, Wade, our director of student life, has got some amazing activities planned that entirety of welcome week uh, for everybody that comes on campus. So uh, we, we do have some plans in the works. We are anticipating a very busy uh, end of July and beginning of August. Um, are, is there any questions? Eric, do you have a number you can give us of, of how many students you 
for prospective students that we had this year, or how many contacts you had? Yeah, so uh, the, the number of uh, prospective students that we have, raw numbers, and some of these were, were juniors as well, uh, was right around 1,383. So, and, um, you know, kind of like what we had said in uh, previous years, or in uh, one of the previous town halls, last year we were only able to see about 700, you know, potential students, prospective students. So we, we doubled that number this year. It's one of the reasons why we're, I, I think we're kind of seeing our, our high roll to be steady over the summers because we, we had that pool of people to draw from. So, okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Joel? Joel Diggs is coming next. He's our TRIO director. If you don't know about the TRIO program, we just want to take a few minutes to share that. Um, they help a, uh, a wonderful population of students and they provide services. It's all soft money and education. When we say soft money, it's, it's grant money and we're very lucky to have this grant. Thank you. Uh, as he said, my name is Joel Figs. I'm the director of student support services here at Seward County. Um, and what we are is a federally funded grant program, as Brad mentioned. Uh, I am funded to serve 160 students, uh, which we hit that number not too long ago uh, for this uh, most recent cohort year. And because I'm funded at 160, that's really something that needs to happen every year, of course, as us hit our numbers. Um, we work with students that are considered a little bit more at risk, and I'm always kind of on the hunt for potential students for our program. So I'm, I'm looking for students that are considered first generation, which means that neither parent completed a four-year baccalaureate program or students that are of a lower financial uh, income uh, or family income or students that have received some type, some type of disability service. So if a student meets any one of those criteria, they can be a part of our program. Um, about 67% of our students have to be considered first generation and of lower income. Uh, there are a variety of services that we can provide to them, academic advisement, of course. Uh, I advise, as the director, I advise probably around 60 of those students. Uh, I have a full-time advisor that handles about 100. Uh, we also provide uh, tutoring services available in all subject areas. Our tutoring center is located right next door to our office, so it's extremely handy. Uh, we also provide workshops throughout the school year, and these are success workshops, um, whether it's how to prepare for a math exam or how to write an outline, how to write proper note cards, those types of things. Uh, we also push cultural enrichment. Uh, I, was able, I was very fortunate to get to take a, a group of students to Kansas City, to Union Station not too long ago, and we went through the Holocaust Museum exhibit. Uh, which that actually is not much after we finished that it actually all went back to Poland So we felt very fortunate, but so we try to get our folks out and about we love Southwest Kansas But it's also good to, to kind of check out the rest of the state and other other areas of this region uh, I have worked in higher education for uh, 27 years and of that about 23 has been at the community college level and so I've been very fortunate to to uh, work in, in in an arena similar to this uh, here at Seward County. I will be here uh, four years this coming November. So it's been a, a great move for me and my, my wife, uh, who is a teacher, and she actually just accepted a position in Garden City as an assistant principal. So she will be driving back and forth from Liberal to Garden City. Uh, but uh, we we're very fortunate to be out here. But we love what we do. Um, you know, and, and one thing that I always say is that when people ask what we do, and I, I basically say, well, we get paid to help people, you know, and when I wake up in the morning, I wake up with a, with a little almost smile on my face because I know that, you know, I can use some of the missteps that perhaps I made as a student myself, believe it or not, once or twice back in the day, uh, if I can uh, save a student from, from, you know, perhaps some of those errors along the way, I want to, I want to try to do that. So that's what we do. What we, do. we work with at-risk students. Any questions? Is that primarily boys or girls? You know what? It is a, it, I would say probably more girls than boys that are in the program. Um, I don't have that right off the top of my head, that, that broken down, but uh, you know, we, we have an application process, and in fact, I'm glad you 
brought that up. I brought some applications, brochures along. If anyone in here knows of someone that could benefit from our services, please feel free to grab an application as well as a brochure. But, uh, you know, it's just a continual kind of reaching out, letting people know of our services, seeking them out as opposed to waiting uh, for them to come to us. We, we go to them and that's by a variety of means, whether it's presentations to developmental classes or, you know, just, you know, asking uh, various instructors if we can pop in and have 10 minutes within their classes, whether it's a math class or English or speech or whatever it might be, art. Um, so we, we really make the rounds and because of our location, we're very centrally located. So we're right in between financial aid and the registrar's office. So we're, we're in a prime spot on campus and uh, we're very visible. There are some schools that kind of keep their, their trio program off kind of in a, in a corner of the campus. I'm very happy to, to not be in that situation here. Yes, sir. Can you hand him the mic? We have 160 students that are in our program, and yes, of that, go ahead. How does that 160 meet the needs of the community as, as, as you perceive it? Well, our, our number one goal uh, with our program is graduation, you know, or the completion of, of a certificate. So uh, we want the folks that are, let's say, um, going back to school, and we have a lot of non-traditional students that are in our program. These are folks that are beyond the age of 22. They might be 42, they might be 62. These are folks that are getting educated, completing degrees, uh, and many of them, of course, live in the community, and because of their, their uh, educational process, uh, they contribute better to the overall community of Liberal, we feel, so. Yes. So, so um, because you are um, grant funded to 160 students, do um, the students who are in the TRIO program, do they have to be full-time students or do you take students that are? We, we take full and part-time students. Okay. Yeah. Right. So we have many folks that are working. We have a lot of students that are working full-time jobs and because of that, uh, there, you know, we encourage them to, to do what they can. We don't want to totally overwhelm them. If, if you're working 40 plus hours a week, taking 18 hours a semester probably isn't an extremely wise idea unless you just absolutely have to do it. So we, we try to be very upfront and uh, approachable, really, as well as what we do. Other questions? Just on that note, uh, just typically the, the, the national data tells us that out of those students that are in the trio, the 160 trio, 40% of those students would not be successful if they didn't have the support that we provided in that program. So when, when I think about like changing someone's life, that program, and it's on a five-year cycle, is that right? So every, we, we monitor every, but we're up, we're up to a new RFP since they were five years, right? So um, if you talk to your legislators, I talked to Senator Moran, who was here yesterday, I said, hey, keep on pushing that program. But, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a big, big help. So uh, Dr. Jones is going to come up next and talk a little bit about our strategic planning. We are, as many of you know, in a uh, new planning cycle phase. Our goal is to have it rolled out and have our board of trustees approve it uh, the first part of October. So we're very excited. We've got a lot of people, a lot of community members working on that. So she's going to give us a quick update on that. Hi, um, I was privileged to participate in the core strategic team that was selected or appointed or volunteered or however you want to say that um, in late April, um, including myself and Joel Figs and Kyle Woodrow and Dr. Suzanne Campbell. We, we formulated a plan and part of that plan was to establish focus groups from different um, sectors of our community um, and then from those focus groups gather um, data and information and form uh, feedback sessions where we kind of decipher if for a better word some of those um, some of that information our first uh, focus group and feedback session was in June 
We have another one coming, actually two coming up in July, uh, two of each. One, um, one is uh, we've, we've started uh, the process and then kind of came around and determined that we need to have a specific focus group for Spanish speaking um, individuals in the community. That will be July 27th. Uh, July 13th, we're going to have the focus group for the community, um, school boards, people in the surrounding areas, um, and then we have um, feedback sessions July 20th when uh, faculty and staff kind of get full back from um, summer. We will have <coughs> faculty and staff uh, focus group, and then we'll have um, then we'll have our feedback sessions and then all these uh, meetings are intended to basically assess the current and future goals and and what successes we've had what's our direction and um, I give kudos to Brad for having the vision to really make sure that we're on track and um, asking asking us to just determine where we need to go what's the best plan um, because we, we as a community college need to serve our community and we need to serve our business partners and we need to be on the right track and we can't just assume in that process that we're on the right track without really gathering feedback. So um, that vision of getting that started, getting that ball rolling, getting that information in so that we can better serve you all and make sure that our, our goal and our direction as a college moving forward is best serving our community. And um, I'm so privileged to be a part of not only that process, but being a part of this institution. Um, every day I come to work and I'm like, so glad that I'm here, um, that all these paths that I've been on in my life led me here. Um, so I'm very grateful. And uh, if you ever wanna come and visit the industrial tech and see some of the fantastic things that we have to offer, including our amazing motorcycle, our machine technology, our grain elevator operator, or welding, anything you want to see, I'm happy to give a tour and help you um, see what we offer. So um, that's my happy place. So do you have any questions for me? I'll give you all the, you know, details. So any questions about that process? I know that it's, it's kind of an undertaking to think about the goals and directions of a college and have that processed in such a short time, but I believe that our timeline is going to get us there, and the sooner we can get there, the sooner we can, sooner we can see that our momentum is going in the right direction. So, where do people find you? Here, I'm in this building in the front. If you go in the front, kind of past the little people on the water tower, I'm in that front building, and um, you can come see me or Candace Olson, the industrial tech secretary, or Norma Jean Dodge and BNI, and we can direct you and you can come see me and we can go walk around and look at stuff and I have the most exciting program so I would and I like to talk so he has no idea he gave me a mic that he's not going to get it back for a minute I'm just kidding so um, but yes love to visit with you and talk and see about all the things that we have and I like to get input from people so if you have ideas or suggestions or things that we want to try or do differently or um, avenues that maybe you don't know that we have or haven't thought about. I would love to get your input no matter where you are in the community. I think that's a valuable resource. So, Do you have another question? Sorry, I should have given you the mic. Does anybody else have a question? Come on, one, everybody else got questions. Brad, do you have a question for me? <laughs> oh, dear. I, you know, one of the things, and I got asked this question, that, you know, they're like, well, this strategic plan is really a long process you're going through. Yeah, I get it. I could have written a strategic plan in a weekend, but that would have been Brad Bennett's plan. That's not what we need. We need a sewer county plan. And that's why I said I want a group of people. I will provide guidance and feedback on what I need to know and what we need to do, what's our values, and I will help fulfill that mission and fulfill those goals. But I mean, yeah, I could have cranked this out in a weekend, but that's not, and there's a lot of, I, I've, I've been around that before. Um, I remember working for an institution and, and we outsourced it. We brought in a company, from Wichita and they came in and talked to our folks and in about a week, two weeks, we had a strategic plan, cost us about $10,000. And uh, when HLC put us on probation, guess what? what's one of the things they cited? You didn't have a strategic plan. 
We did, it was on a bookshelf, had a bunch of dust on it. So it doesn't matter, I mean, to, to me, we need to figure out what our campus needs, what our community needs. It's my job to make sure we fulfill that and, and then we move forward. So it's just like yesterday when Preston, uh, we've been here, what, Preston, a, a week? A week, yeah. And we're out pulling weeds. It's like, welcome to the wonderful, beautiful life of a community college employee. We do absolutely everything. He came from the University of Arkansas. So uh, I'm guessing uh, he was not part of the weed pull pulling crew there. So uh, all of our employees wear multiple hats and we all chip in when we can. So thank you, Dr. Jones. Mr. Bailey, uh, poor Mike, you know, I always pick on him. Uh, he does uh, tons of different things for Sir County Community College. And he recently became our director of our parades. And uh, we are in parade season. Uh, so. He's going to give us a quick update on parades and, and what that looks like for us, okay? Well, part of the outreach is we do service um, 10 or 11 high schools, counting liberal. So we want to be a part of all of the communities as well. So one of the opportunities we've had um, is to be in parades. Well, this last year kind of put a little damper on some of that, but we've started now that we can get back in the, the swing of things. So this year we were in the homecoming parade here in Liberal, and our cosmetology students were having a blast out there um, helping us. Um, and then I believe it was Pancake Day that the tennis team, they, they were way too much fun. Um, but we just go down and just let, you know, let the crowds know we're there. We also went to Beaver in April for Cowship Days. Um, we want to make sure that um, some of our new faculty or, you know, anybody has the opportunity to see what, you know, our surroundings are. Uh, we've been to Satana in May and was in their big parade. Um, so it's just a matter of getting, you know, where, where we're at, we're just a part of the community. Uh, we hopefully will be able to be in more, you know, of the high school homecoming parades. Um, we. We were offered it a few times. I just, we just didn't have the people to do it. Now we have a few more people getting excited about it. Since Brad says get excited about it, so yeah. now he just kind of helps encourage the parade. So anyway, this one I was actually excited because we will be at the Fourth of July parade um, on Monday, um, and Amber has um, graciously. I don't know whether it's gracious or she's going to show off the motorcycle, but anyway, she, that's the major part of the float this time. So we're all excited that something new and exciting is you know, happening with it. Um, in August, I believe we have the PRCA rodeo. They will have a parade. And then Labor Day is just around the corner. They tell me cooler weather is coming. Um, that um, the Kansas, or the Kansas, Little, uh, little World Spirit <laughs> gives me. So, um, if you know parades, let me know. You know, I always pick on you know athletics and the CDL crew because if we're not able to bring people, we have a big semi that has a lot of faces on it. So it takes up a block by itself. So one way or the other, we're we try to be in a parade, and it's just another way to make sure that people know we're still in business. Questions? And we're also, in, you know, involved in their communities. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I, I think that the parades are often the heart of every small town in, in this part of the country. So I think it's really important we're, we're involved in there. We're throwing, throwing out a thousand t-shirts on one day. So uh, it's our, our big step in making sure everyone in Seward County has a, a same shirt. Maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm, Maybe, maybe I notice more than I should, but I feel like I'm seeing more Saints gear when I'm walking around Walmart, and so it just makes me really excited to see that out there. So we'll be getting rid of a thousand, and on Monday we'll continue to do that. Uh, Carla is coming up next. Um, if you haven't met Carla yet, um, we are we stole her from USD 480. I don't like doing that to Dr. Carter, but the opportunity presented itself uh, about a year ago, I guess, and and she's my admin assistant and does a wonderful job of helping communicate. Uh, with the community. Uh, she's a wonderful, bright, uh, young person that does a wonderful job in communicating. Uh, she often goes on the radio with me and, and uh, takes what I say and, and uh, translates it to Spanish, which is amazing. I always impress when someone can jump back and forth between two languages because I know that person's way smarter than I am. So Carlos will give us a quick update. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. Thanks to my boss. 
I took a note from him. I wore green pants because he likes to wear green things. So an update would be that the BJ's game, during the BJ's baseball game, there will be fireworks uh, between 9.30 and 10, depending on if it gets too late and if there's an extra inning, if I got that right. Sorry, I'm not a baseball fan, guys. No offense. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and I, part of our leadership initiative here at Seward County Community College, will now be starting a podcast for Latina women or Hispanic women and men, if they'd like to join me. And I just wanted to be able to push that out and get our uh, students out there, get them to understand that they have a voice and they are heard and they are important. As President Bennett stated, he stole me from the district or I kind of willingly came, either way you want to put it. <laughs> and I've never worked at a place where I've been so supportive he gives me the power to take what I want and create it, and I love it, and I feel very heard, and I'm very happy I got this opportunity. So thank you, everyone, for having me. Thank you. And that's that's going to be Carla's podcast. She kind of left part out. She's oh, she's, she's she's stirring up projects. So I'm, I'm very excited for it. I think it'll have it's a great opportunity for our students to give them a platform. You know, we have several students already have podcasts. We had a. I can't remember the young lady's name or Andrea basketball Tribble. player. Andrea Tribble. Yes, uh, she had a great podcast that I, that I listened to. So it's really great to see these young people flourish and, and talk about what's important to them and what's on their mind. So next up, we have uh, Dan with Athletics. Give us a quick uh, update. We've had a lot going on and we're kind of, it seems like Athletics has changed and where it's going on 12 months out of the year now. So. <laughs> kind of like what Brad said earlier, People sometimes ask, you know, are you enjoying your summer? Is this thing slowing down? And you know, I swear to you, I think the summer is even busier than in the season. So I'll try to back up a little bit since the last time we talked because uh, we had a team win a national championship, our men's tennis team, second ever national championship at, here at Seward. So uh, really excited about it. Um, it was a great run. The team has never finished higher than third. So, you know, it was a really amazing thing to be down in Tyler, Texas, in one of the best tennis facilities in the country. and. Um, really at the end it was head-to-head -head versus Tyler and, and we pulled it out in front of that crowd and everything so moment I'll never forget and uh, I know for those players there's something special about being at Seward with that. Um, running off that what also makes me extremely proud of our tennis team is uh, that men's team finished with a 3.63 GPA. Uh, highest of all our athletic teams. They're a nominee for ac academic team of the year in the nation. Uh, so combine they are students, but athletes together, they were elite at both. So I'm really, really proud of them there. Academically, though, across the board, we averaged a 3.2 GPA in all our sports. 39 students were receiving NJCA all academic honors. That's basically um, close to 35% 30 of our student athletes are being recognized by the NJCA for their academic work. And we got three teams nominated for our academic team of the year. And we'll find out here probably two to three weeks where they ended up finishing in the nation on academics. Brad talked about some summer stuff. We do have a, a lot of athletes that came here this summer. Uh, almost 30 athletes were on campus. A lot of them, most of them were taking classes, so that definitely helped with enrollment. They were getting out, helping in the dorms, cleaning up campus, really being an active member. Um, then you might have seen some social media stuff out there that we've been traveling and playing in the summer. The NJCA started a new thing where basketball teams are allowed to play in the summer to help their recruiting and help get students along academically and, and everything else. And it's been such a successful program that in August we expect the NJCA to allow all sports teams to be here in the summer and play summer leagues. So that means our baseball and softball teams can stay and actually enjoy the warm summers that we have and get on the field. So. We're really excited about that. I know academically it's been great because we're getting a lot of students closer to graduation. Athletically, it's great to get them in the weight room, and I think we can be valuable members on campus helping out Brad and everybody else getting things done. He's talked a lot about the projects, and it's been a great start because many times when students come in August, you know, next thing you know it's December, right? <laughs> you forget and move, you get out into the field, and this has allowed a moment to for them to become a Seward County student, and it's been really great. Um, kind of on that note with Seward County, it's probably something you won't see, we probably won't really put an article out, but in conjunction with President Bennett, uh, Celeste and Housing, and, and everybody else at the campus, we've been really coming up with some new initiatives to try to grow our enrollment in athletics. And you know, we've talked about adding some sports, and that's definitely something Brad and I talk about all the time. And, 
hopefully we'll be able to come out with more things there. But I think there's opportunity with our current sport. So uh, blessed to the foundation, blessed to Brad, that's some things that we've been able to do. You'll see a lot more potential walk-ons on our teams in the upcoming year. Maybe a little bit more emphasis with some having some Kansas kids um, because we got to get reconnected into the community and, and we don't want to turn anybody away. So on our men's basketball team alone, you might see a roster of 25 individuals with a bunch of uh, somewhat regional kids because if they want to come be on the team, we're never going to say no. So it's an emphasis that all our sports are putting in and you will see that on the fields and, and on the benches. So. I'm really proud of my coaches because that's been a lot of work. They've had to go into a lot of uh, the local high schools and develop those connections. And it's not something that you necessarily put out in social media or in articles, and the results aren't necessarily something that we broadcast. But I think it's something that's very important for the community to know that we're putting an effort out there. And even if we can just get two or three extra kids on the volleyball team, that equates to about a 10% increase in enrollment for that sector. If all my teams do that, and hopefully we're providing that 10% extra enrollment for the school and setting the model that hopefully can grow enrollment. So something I wanted to talk about and may not have the opportunity again, because uh, again, once August comes, we're back in season and we'll kind of forget everything going on and just trying to survive. So I was going to introduce Preston. Everybody else has already introduced Preston. So I'm extremely happy that Preston, trust me, the last six months without having that position has been tough. And one week alone, I've been just throwing paperwork at them and they take care of me, take care of me. So thank you, Preston. So any questions? Um, one of the things I think the community college is for is to help local kids move off to colleges later on. And I, I know you've talked about adding walk-ons and what I hear you saying is local Kansas kids would be walk-ons. And I don't, I'm, not, I'm putting words in your mouth understand that but like when we went to Dodge City last year and we sat in front of a gentleman who made a comment about look at Sir County they don't have any Americans on their team well we corrected that we said yes they do well they don't have any Kansas kids well yeah they do there's there's two well they don't play well yeah they do and we found out he was the president of Dodge City Community College but <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guess the, the point is, is that just bringing kids to walk on I don't I don't think what what I want to know is does the athletic department feel like its job is to help Kansas kids move on to a four-year school? Because when you look at the rosters, there's not hardly any Kansas kids. And, and the other thing I would say, it's okay to add other sports, but I don't think we fund or support the ones we do have. Case in point being, I think we need another multi-purpose gym because at some point having three nationally ranked teams compete for the same gym space, and then if a tennis team wants to have some indoor time, they could use a gym too, and it just doesn't seem to me like there's been any emphasis on getting that type of facility going so that we can really support the teams we do have. I think Dodge City's got like 10 full ride volleyball scholarships. Barton's got six. I think we've got two. But we're, Seward County is a top 25 team. So I, the guys said, what, what needs to be done to help get that to happen? Because I think that also affects lack of attendance at games, lack of support from the community. So. Thank you. We've got a little bit to unpack there. So, um, first off, uh, we have, uh, emphasis that I really like to push my coaches, and I'll steal the credit from my men's basketball coach. Um, well, him and I obviously go back almost eight, nine years now. And so, you know, we kind of see eye to eye on a lot of these things, but he talks about an inside out recruiting uh, pitch or purpose as a team. We should never recruit a kid from, say, New York City that's identical to the kid that's here in Liberal, right? You start inside and you fill the needs of your team working out. So, um, yeah, that, that's kind of the, the, the vision that all the coaches are taking. And, uh, yeah, I did kind of, like, imply that there is a walk on but I, it's absolutely something that we've changed. I've always uh, really pressed on my coaches. I get it if you don't want to offer a kid a scholarship in the region or locally. But that same kid better not be signing a scholarship with Barton, Dodge, Garden City, somebody in our, as we consider as a competition. So, and we started to notice that maybe two, three years ago that we weren't signing kids, but somebody else was. I get it when a liberal high women's basketball player receives a Division One scholarship and goes, and we, we didn't sign them. Like, that's, that would have been our job to get them to Division One anyway. But when that same kid's going to Garden City, that's something we can't have happen. So, no, there's definitely an emphasis on that. And uh, when it comes to scholarships, yes, you're seeing a lot more um, 
Kansas kids on scholarship than I saw two years ago. To be honest, two years ago, I'm not even sure how many Kansas kids we had on all our rosters. I can tell you this upcoming year, we're probably over double digits on Kansas kids on scholarship. Um, so we're definitely making some strides there, and I think a lot of it is putting the effort to get those kids before they sign somewhere else. Um, when you talk about facilities, yeah, that's something we talk about all the time. And uh, when my first day on the job back in 2019, basically, uh, I show up in the gym with all the sports, and we had baseball hitting up here, tennis hitting in the in, in the west side of the thing, softball on the mezzanine. I'm like, we got all seven teams in the gym right now. So thankfully for the Champion Center, that's kind of been cut in half. But I don't think the problem's gone away. Obviously, instead of having uh, seven teams in the bleachers and everywhere else, we got the team still needing the court, and we're definitely a court behind. And we can't host volleyball tournaments because you need multiple courts to host volleyball tournaments. Uh, both of our basketball teams are really working hard to do a major tournament here, bring teams all across the country here to play instead of us going to Florida and Arizona. And we've been extremely close. Facilities have been a major issue on that. So something I know Brad and I have talked about and something we're going to have to definitely put a lot of effort into. So did I get them all? Yeah. I'm going to piggyback on the scholarship bill. Uh, it is, I do think it's a balancing act. and. It's interesting, the state of Kansas, the legislation uh, ordered a, a, post, uh, a post audit for athletics for the 19 community colleges. Uh, and they're going to look at the number of, of uh, both US kids that we have and in-state kids. Uh, but they will also be looking at the, the amount of money that we're spending on scholarships. Um, and on that piece, we are very, very low, which is good and bad. Um, we spend about $7 a credit hour on scholarships. It's the lowest, to my knowledge, out of all the other schools. So on that audit, it's going to, we're going to look good from that aspect because we're not spending uh, very much money in that area, which is uh, a big push at the, at the state level right now. But it, and it's also bad because we need to improve that. And the board, we've already had that conversation of taking that $7 and increasing it so we can support our programs more. I don't think we'll ever be giving you know, 10, 11 floor rides for basketball. I just don't think that's who we are. But I think there, there's definitely areas for improvement there from where, where we're curr currently at. So, in the gym space, we talk about that often, about trying to find a way you know, in our master planning to work in another practice facility because it is, you know, I, I'm a big believer. I'm always telling Dan, practice shouldn't be when classes are going on. You know, and, and he's like, we have six hours worth of, <laughs> worth of practice every single day. When do you want this to occur? And so it is a, a major concern. So any other athletic questions? Also, I'm having lunch with Harold tomorrow, so I, I will not tell him to email the <laughs> conference. So. I just do. I haven't had lunch with him, unfortunately. <laughs> That's not a joke. Kyle's will come up next and talk to us about the Champion Center and some tax credits. Who doesn't love tax credits? Um, Jim, thank you for asking us questions because I really think now I've found the next chair of our next uh, campaign for uh, fundraising for this. So uh, we're very excited about that. We're, we're very fortunate to have what we do have. Um, I've just been up in Colby looking at you know, a development uh, officer conference and you know, just seeing some of the new stuff they build and modernizing and how schools are doing that uh, and picking, picking up. And you know, we've got to get there. It's definitely something we have to do. And, and thankfully, we are doing that with our Champion Center, um, and we are, we're almost there. We've had a little bit of a slowdown with it. The, the city changed some rules on us about how we could build it, and so we had to kind of slow back down and um, revisit some of the plans and, and get those resubmitted and everything. I'm proud to say that I think we're, we're pretty close to, to getting that finished up and, and getting that signed off and then finishing this up. The exciting part about it is, is that the, the plans are almost done and all of that's about ready to go. The next part is we still need to raise a little bit of money for that. Um, but the state has passed uh, some, some legislature that has approved tax credits for community college and doing improvement projects and, and a few other things. Um, we can apply for these credits and apply them to this project, which in speaking with uh, President Bennett and, and others, this is what we are going to with these credits for our institution. There's 500, or there's $5 million worth of credits to across the sector. 19 schools have to split it. 
Each school can get only up to 500,000, but do the math, there's not 500,000 available for every school. So it's gonna become first come, first serve a little bit on that. And um, we can get up to 500,000 then for that. The good thing about these tax credits are that they pay out their 60%, so uh, you can get 60% back uh, on, on purchasing those. Uh, there is a minimum of $1,000 that they can be sold for. That was set by the legislature or by the schools actually agreeing to that. Um, there, but we would prefer that we either sell them it with one go or <laughs> two. I mean, we'll keep working our way down until we get them sold, but uh, we don't want to you know, limit anybody's uh, thing. Uh, they're pretty open who can get them. There's only a few businesses that wouldn't qualify, but most do and certainly individuals do. So we're um, still trying to get all the final details on where to go, the, the link to go live that we can get the information on. But um, please, if you're interested, if you know of some folks that might be interested, um, we really think this is an opportunity for us to move a project along. Uh, the generosity of the, of the Sharp family and many others who have contributed to this, we, we really wanna see this get, get done and move, move forward with it because as we go around and we look at some of the issues that are affecting both our community and things, one of the exciting things about this facility is that it's not just for our baseball team or our softball team is meant to be a facility um, that is open to the public to, to some degree and, and, and able to be used and so our, our BJ's can use it there we have other groups in town that can use it and things like that our kids sink and, and things like that and so this is an exciting facility and I think the sooner we can get this finished the more excited we're still all going to be that to get going on the next thing which is is probably some tennis courts and, and another ox gym and, and some things like that. I can't, I can't say for sure. We have some other projects on, on this side of the house too. But, uh, but yeah, so that's the opportunity for us. That's where we're at. And like I said, the tax credits are an incredible opportunity for us. Um, we would like to be able to claim all 500,000 of those and, and move, move forward, move forward with, with all of this. So any questions that anybody has? And just to follow up on that a little bit, so phase 2A is essentially what is completed now, minus the one set of restrooms. Um, when we look at the at the budget or the, the numbers that we're getting from the builder, um, from what we currently have from the from the last campaign, if we were able to sell the 500000 and we were able to put a little bit of COVID funds, it would get us in that ballpark to, to wrap it up, uh, which would be a wonderful thing. I think we're all committed to that. We have a duty of care of that from the beginning. Uh, to the donors, to the, the past presidents, past administrators, past teams, the community, the board of trustees, everyone's been involved in that. So, all right, what questions do you have? Not all at once. How can we help you? What do you want to talk about? Comments, concerns? Anything or we end. Are you going to start on that? Is Matt Vixler going to be here tomorrow and you're going to start on that as you plan? I don't know when Matt's coming back to town. Our, our plan is not to stop on it. So as soon as Kyle's been working with him and Coach Davidson some, and Dan has, has been involved and uh, um, uh, Matt's updating a few things on the plans, and then those. But we can't get done if we don't start. That's correct. But we can't we can't do that next phase until those plans are officially all approved. So that's and the and the plans that ne never stop. Uh, we want to keep rolling on it. Uh, you know, we were having a conversation today. Once we get to go uh, to finish the restrooms. Uh, well, there was some things, and Kyle, I don't know if you want to touch on the plans at all, but there's there were some things that we're still having to get it adjusted and there was well the the, the plans had a there, we had initially you know conceptual design had been done and we had presented and done all of that again this project started as a design build which meant we could do it in phases we could just do one part we could get it to there and then we could work on the rest of it a little bit later to to, to figure it out the rules changed a little bit with the city um, saying no we want you to have it all done we need the full set of plans and you got to have all the MEP and all that kind of stuff finished up with it so we had to go back um, and figure out how we could go ahead and, and get this drawn up 
as we started looking at funding and how to get this across the finish line, the, the new plans to finish it up was going to be an additional probably 1.6 initially, uh, in addition to the one that we were spending now just to get to the toilets and the shell that's there now. So we started having to look at how do we do this? What is the purpose of the facility? We knew it was for a hitting facility and some locker rooms and some spaces, but if the intention was really to be for the public as well, the plans needed to reflect that. You can't go out and sell to, to the foundations that we were wanting to apply for for funding, even to the state, to say, hey, this is going to be a public facility, and your plans are really don't look like it's for public at all. And so we had to revisit this a little bit, and we had to make some minor adjustments to that. What we thought we've landed on is something that makes a really great compromise without compromising what we needed to do for our athletic teams that it was being sort of built for in the first place. So we're just at that point of needing to negotiate what can still be taken out and put in. We have found a way now to whittle it back down from a 1.6 or whatever to 900,000. And that's why President Bennett is saying, if we can get the tax credits sold with what we have left in the fund that's there, if the school's willing to kick in some of the, the COVID money, because it is, it's gonna be a public place. We need to have some things like the bathroom, the hospital grade things and signage and, and some of the things that those funds can buy. We don't know, we, we still have to look at that, but. If we can do that, we are 90% we are there to finishing that off. But the key is the plans have to reflect the intention. And it can't be just, well, we'll let it reflect that and we'll change it later. No, no, it has to be the real thing. We, we can't build something and then do a bait and switch on the public later. And, well, actually, we didn't really uh, get it there. So that's been the holdup. We, we've had some relative, and I do mean relatively minor, alterations to it that would increase it from two big locker rooms to big locker rooms still, but then the ability to have two additional spaces for that. I mean, I look at it and I, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but I know we, we want to build a tennis so I know it, but we just had the tennis team win a national championship and they don't have a place to tie their shoes. And so, you know, baseball team and softball team haven't either, but they're getting that. So how can we build a facility that looks a little bit forward into the future and create some space for us that we know we need. The plan for 2023, at least that I was last aware of in 2024 and 25, is we have to grow enrollment. Well, that's gonna need more space all around and more <laughs> utilization of space that we have. So as we have opportunity in this facility and because of our donors' generosity to create the space as it is, there's a, there's a window there for us to, to, to make it. So we just wanna get that right. I don't want us to build something and then be like after the week after we build it and say, oh, well, I wish we would have had another locker room there and create the space. Yeah, we had the opportunity to do that right now and still meet all the needs that, that it was intended to do. So that, that's where we're, we've been kind of on a little bit of back and forth, trying to get it right, costs and changes and stuff like that. Some of that's not been in our control either. And so as we've waited, we've tried to take the opportunity to have those bigger discussions about it. So. That's where we're at, and, and I, you know, just like Brad said, we met with uh, Coach Davison and, and Dan and myself, and we had a final meeting. We had some final questions that we needed to have answered about some dimensions and some costs if we took out a couple things there that uh, we were told we just needed the hard numbers, and I think we were then gonna be ready to go forward, but we, we need that. We need those numbers. Uh, we need those numbers so that we can apply for the funds and the grants that we were hoping to also apply for to fit, fit that need. So, so we're there, but. Are you telling me that we're a little late till 23 or 24, no. we're just playing with architects? No, no, we can't. We can't afford the cost for both. But what I'm saying is, is that we're there. I'm waiting on them, the architects, to come back with some numbers and the, the final sort of thing that we can all be happy about and then move forward because we, this needs to get done. I mean, we need to get the building kind of finished. Builder tells me that once we've signed off, he can have his guys here and we can get that knocked out very shortly. Because all the infrastructure is in it. We, we um, you know, as the foundation, we went ahead and fronted the cost for the fire suppression and fronted the cost for the architect. Like, so there's a lot of things that were done already because of what kind of kept changing along the way. And as it changed, we kept adding to it and making it done. And so we're, we're, we're a lot closer than, than most people think once we sign off. Um, it, could this be the 
time it takes to get the materials here, basically. So we will not wait till my cool, I, I can't make a problem, but if this thing goes longer than a few more months before we have the decision, I, to me, that's not, we're not doing what we need to be doing. So we got to get this decided and, and done. And like one one of those things we're waiting on, like we had a conversation. Um, well, Mr. Sharp, you and I had a conversation, and, and then we had it as a group about maybe taking out essentially showers for the ums. And you know what is, what's that cost savings if we do that? You know, is it is it twelve thousand or is it thirty five thousand? Thirty five thousand, I might be interested. You know, twelve twelve thousand probably just say put them in. And so those are sort of some of those things we're just waiting on. You know, just to make sure that we we spend that money in the best possible way to make sure that we maximize our space, so. Well, uh, one example of that was we had reconceptualized the front a little bit because we needed a nice welcome area in the tennis. So we had moved the toilets, the public toilets, over to the side a little bit. Well, when we got the cost back and we were trying to now put the sharp and the pencil, our builder says, hey, if we don't move those, I can save you about $450,000. Okay, they're going back. We're, we're going to leave them where they were. We will decorate the toilets, and they will have a welcome, welcome message when you walk into that. <laughs> so it's just little things like that. And had we just pushed it, it we would have spent another three five hundred thousand dollars. We didn't know we needed to spend it. So I appreciate the care that has been taken. I know that for those who have been working and waiting on this project for a long time, it feels like it's forever. I, I've only been here for like almost two years. Kind of got it about half a year into it, maybe one, and I'm like thinking to myself, this is moving pretty fast, really. I mean, we're, we're, getting, we're getting things going, but I, I certainly understand that from the perspective of those who have given the money and who have been waiting for this and where the conceptual, the conception of it has been from years ago and waiting for it that, you know, it's like, let's get this done. And so we're, we, Brad and I both agree, we have a duty to care to our community, to our donors, and we want to, we want to see this across the finish line and are, are looking for everything Other questions? We did have Senator Moran here yesterday. Uh, it was a great tour, great visit. Uh, we are seeking some congressional funds. Uh, they have the ability to apply con congressional funds for areas that we consider essentially a national crisis, especially from an employment standpoint. So we're seeking those, those funds for our CDL, uh, our new building there. It makes a lot of sense as we have a, a truck driving shortage across our nation uh, that, that we, we could get some congressional help in that area. So I'm hopeful, hopeful for that. We did receive the 1.875 million from the state of Kansas for that facility. We have applied for a million dollar KDOT grant that we're waiting to hear back on that we feel pretty good about. And if we get some congressional funds, uh, we also are meeting with Seaboard on a regular basis, uh, national carriers and a few of the other uh, major industry partners. Uh, so we're excited to see what, what that entails as well. So. If there's no other questions, we will thank you for coming out. I know uh, these take a little bit of time, but I do appreciate the feedback and the conversations. A lot of times in these, we won't have people not say anything or speak up during the town hall, but they'll email me or contact me later. Uh, we are always open to listen to any concern that a community member has, an employee has. Uh, that's, that's what our job is. And oftentimes, uh, we've created a concern that we didn't know was there, and so then we have to reflect back and make adjustments and push forward. So just let us know, reach out to us if you have any questions. I tell you, um, I know I, I say this over and over, I am so excited to be here, to be back at Seward County Community College. I've, I've enjoyed, it's been, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I mean, we, we bought and sold more houses than most realtors have in the last year and a half, uh, but I've had more fun since February. Uh, there's been one morning that I didn't feel great. I didn't want to go to work a little bit, and, and, and by 8.30, I was ready to roll. And so uh, I, I'm just very blessed to have a job that I, I'm passionate about and I get up and, and get to come to work every day. I know my employees get, you know, kind of, and this guy's like going 100 miles an hour all the time because I, I just randomly text him like, have, have you done this, have you done that? Follow up with this person, follow up with that. And that, I can't help it, that's just how my brain works. Uh, but, you know, our, our community is awesome. Our support is awesome. Um, and, and we're seeing it, I, I think, you know, the next five years, we're going, to, we're going to see a lot of growth and a very exciting time. So thanks so much for coming out tonight. We appreciate your support.